Uh, Scott Perry said he might jump on, so maybe, but yeah, they have access to it, I think. Okay. Oh, you? <laughs> Therese, you have at least 13 people on Zoom already. Yay, thank you, Chris. We can't see them. Is there a way that I can monitor the chat for her, or are you guys going to do that? <laughs> um, you can sign into Zoom on your computer, and then you should be able to monitor it, because okay. I'm going to sign off in a second. I'll go ahead and do that. I'm going to do that before you sign off. Chris, it's Edith. Can you make me co host, please? Edith, I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to make you the host. Oh, wow. Woohoo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to make you the host. Okay, Therese, you're there in the class. I'm in the class. Um, I wanted to, you know, make sure I didn't know if we were going to be webinar style or how it was exactly going to be. So I'll be in the class to help with with that. I'm also going to be jump on Zoom um, just so I can see if there's any questions that anyone has. But I, I see you're on it too. So um, do you mind if I do a brief introduction of Jackie, Miss Jackie? Yeah, that would be wonderful if you could. So Miss Jackie Berry has been amazing. She, uh, I think I stumbled onto knowing who you were, probably from Mark Miana, who's actually in here. We were talking about some issue with HOA documents, and he said, there's a place that will look at your HOA documents for you for a charge. <laughs> so what ends up happening is, as, as a seller, if you're selling something in an HOA, correct me if I'm wrong, Jackie, you need to give the, the buyer the HOA documents. However, everyone always puts it on the buyer to do their due diligence. Whereas really, if there's something wrong with the HOA documents, could it fall on the seller? That's number one. Number two, what our responsibility is as agents to look through the HOA documents. And then number three, Jackie said that within the next 15 years or something or 10 years that more than half of the real estate in California is going to have an HOA. So Kind of important that we know how to know what we're looking at and how to interpret them and how to direct our clients. So we are honored to have you here, Jackie. She's coming in all the way from Texas, and uh, we're honored to have you with us. So um, without further ado, please tell us. I guess we can start off with common pitfalls and what to look for in a prelim and whatnot. Perfect. I'm so excited about being here with you today, mainly because the industry changes so rapidly. I was saying to somebody the other day, I feel like I'm in warp speed that, you know, it could be very well that we were in outer space, but homeowner associations are not going away. I know everybody said, I don't want to sell those or I don't sell homeowners associations. And so today I get to give you a little bit of information to make it a little easier for you and to assist you, whether you're on the seller side or on the buyer side, to understand what your fiduciary duties are to your client and what your client's fiduciary duties are to one another, whether they're the buyer or the seller, what the seller is required to do. And of course, we've got that little party called the Homeowner Association and what their responsibility is to your seller or the current owner. And so, um, I'd like to start off a little bit uh, with some statistics, and just like was just being told, is that 55% of, well, let's see, excuse me, there's 55,000 associations in the state of California. That's a lot. However, within the next eight to 10 years, 50% of our market will be condominiums because condominiums go up and they get, uh, cities are loving the take a partially blight or a blight area, build a high rise or a mid rise, they can get a lot more taxes, they get a lot more people in that particular area. So you're gonna start seeing that shift. shift. Right now, 55,000 is 25% of our housing market. So there are basically a couple of styles of home ownership that we're gonna talk about. I know everybody likes to use that term townhouse. But a lot of times people go, why did you get into this business and how did you get in this business? And so I kind of like to just tell a quick story. 
that when I was young in my 20s, I had a five-year-old daughter in my mid-20s. I had a five-year-old daughter and I was just in the process of getting a divorce and my mother was a real estate agent. And she goes, oh, honey, there's this thing called a condominium. I think you're gonna really like it. Some of them you may know it by the name that I'm gonna use. It was a McEwen fourplex. I bought the number one unit from the um, appraiser for FHA. I paid $12,500 and it just sold for all, almost a million dollars. So she also told me at that time, honey, diamonds are not a girl's best friend property is. So mm -hmm. over the years, I learned some very important lessons from my mother, as a lot of us do. And I just wanted you to know that when I was going to college at that time also, and I walked over, I was going to City College at that time, and I had a professor that came to class and he said, anybody who wants to be a real estate agent, stay seated. Anyone who doesn't want to be a real estate agent, you can go to the classroom next door. 26 of us stayed, 26 of us got our real estate licenses. And to show us how easy it was at that point, um, our professor took us to Stickney's restaurant, which was a, they had the best French onion soup ever. And we sold two duplexes behind the mall for on a napkin. Now you know what your paperwork looks like, right? That would be impossible today. But in those days, just before that period of time, it was basically just a shake of hands. I'm gonna give you this much for your property and you go to escrow and sign up the paperwork and move on. Pretty daunting, huh, now when we're, when we're looking at it. And most of this has come about because of consumer affairs. So homeowner associations are basically no different. Um, there's a lot of paperwork to them. Most of the time, the members and the board of directors really doesn't understand it. And I hate to say it as of today, I don't believe that the managers do either. Although they have a designation, sometimes um, it's like, I don't know about you, but I went to school, I memorized stuff, I took the test and I passed it. That's pretty much what our property managers do. And then they get thrown into the real world where they're managing a piece of property, mm -hmm. unknowing what they're really getting into. So I, I brought a couple of things. I wanna see if there's any questions right at this point because that will help us, but I'd like to show you a two minute video that will tell you everything you know to, need to know about why is there an association. Perfect. Okay, let me, let me see if I can share my screen here real quick with you. Two minutes, this website is one of my favorites because it tells you everything you, uh, can you see the one that says purpose, purpose of an association? No, not yet. Okay, so let's see here. Oops. There we go. There you go. Okay. So this is just going to take two minutes. Oh my gosh, I hope I don't get thrown out of here. Okay, so if I do, I'll come right back in. All right, let me give you this just two minute little video and then we'll use this as our basis for today. And then I'm going to give you some other pieces. The defining element of a common interest development is that buyers own a separate interest, a unit or lot, coupled with an interest in the common areas. Because there are elements owned in common by members, someone must take care of them. Under the Davis-Sterling Act, the common areas must be managed by a private membership organization, commonly referred to as a homeowners association, community association, property owners association, or owners association. Membership in the association is automatic when a person buys into the development. The association manages the development through a board of directors elected annually by the membership. The bylaws outline how directors are elected, their term in office, and their duties. In most associations, day-to-day -day operations are delegated to a management company or an on-site manager and staff. The primary duty of an association is to preserve property values by maintaining, repairing, and replacing common areas. In a condominium development, it means all structures and amenities. In a gated plan development, it's streets, green belts, and amenities such as a clubhouse. In addition, associations regulate architectural designs in the community. Secondarily, 
An association adopts rules and regulations so members can enjoy their property in peace without interference by other members. That means regulating pets, parking, and nuisances such as noise and smoke, and addressing disputes in the community. To enforce its restrictions, associations can impose fines, suspend privileges, and file lawsuits. An important service provided by associations is security. While they can't guarantee it, most associations provide a reasonable level of privacy and security for their members. To pay for operations, associations adopt annual budgets and levy assessments. Members who don't pay their assessments are subject to enforcement that can result in money judgment against the owner and or foreclosure of their home. Because of these benefits, homeowner associations have grown in popularity with a large and growing percentage of households in the nation now living in common interest developments. Well, I think I got that turned off. Um, so you can see what these associations are like. I hear most a lot of people calling them townhomes. Townhomes is not an ownership. It's either a condominium, which is airspace, walls in, floors up, ceiling down, or it's a planned unit development where they actually own the land beneath them and all the responsibilities thereof. As you saw in the video, it talks about what is an association to do, preserve, repair, and replace. Those are the big things. So most of the time you're gonna hear me talking about um, reserves and some of that, we will be going into that in a little bit of detail. I know we have an hour and a half together. I wanna get as many questions as possible because that will help guide us to what pieces we should that you're experiencing right now that you're gonna to want to know about. I'm a walking encyclopedia. And when in doubt, I go to that Davis Sterling website. It's very easy to find. And sometimes you can take your clients, like they're buying into a condo and you want them to know a little bit more about what they're getting involved in. You can take them to this website and there are several videos that they have done that will help them move through the process. The website is pretty easy. Um, it's called Davis, D-A-V-I-S dash, and then Sterling, S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G. And I won't take the time to go back, but if we need to, we can go back and I show you a little bit more about how to maneuver that particular website. There, a couple of attorneys many years ago started thinking about homeowner association they were specializing in them. And they gathered all of the documents and everything that they needed together and started this website. And then Larry Sterling, who was the Sterling of Davis Sterling, became a business partner. So you can see that there's, I thought I had this turned off. So I thought I had a lot of information that I can't give you that you're going to be able to find there. And a lot of times I'll walk you and your clients through that little website because there's an index on the left hand side. Any subject, like if you wanted to know what is the duty of the seller to disclose. And so I'd like to take just a second to talk about the pecking order. The pecking order basically is the association is responsible for producing documents on behalf of that association, but financials, uh, work orders, and maintaining different things, also getting bids to maintain the common areas. So the association has its very definite duties as to what it needs to do. Then what happens is that the board of directors is elected by the membership. And sometimes um, now they have a whole set of rules and regulations on how they have to elect this board of directors. But anybody who has paid their dues and is in good compliance with the association can volunteer to be on that board. Then they gather the information, they put everybody onto a ballot. They usually, it takes about three months to put this whole thing together. Let's see if I can turn off my phone here. Let's see. For some reason, it's ringing in my ear. Okay, there we go. So the big thing here is that I want to give you as much information and not throwing you an overwhelm. I'm going to take you a walk through 
some of the information that we're actually gathering. I'd like to tie down for you your preliminary title report along to the, the governing documents. I know most of you like to use IO and I love that program. I will tell you that when you give an IO link to a buyer who is not as sophisticated as you are or knowledgeable of what they're buying into, they go into to total overwhelm. So when you send them away with this package and say, you have three days in which to read, understand, and sign off your contingencies, they're just gonna, their head is gonna spin and they're gonna feel like they can't get grounded. It'll be vertigo for them. Some of them take the time. Some of them like to stay up all night and read those documents, but you're only giving them three days in which to evaluate the financial health, the condition of the project, and whether it is operating under the guise of the law. I will tell you that we do a lot of reviews and every agent that I've talked to here within the last couple of weeks said, well, we bought the package. We paid $800 for the package of documents from the HOA. We should be able to rely on that. Well, that's only partially true. You gave them your money. You can rely on that. You got a set of documents, you can rely on that. But whether those documents fulfill the obligation of that association and the board of directors, probably not going to happen. I haven't gotten one complete package this year. And last year, I only got one. And it was from a real estate agent that I work with for the last 20 years. And she understood and won't let the documents come to me unless she's checked every box. So it depends on how much time the agents want to do it. Sometimes an agent is on the board of directors, so it can't be that difficult, right? Well, it is, because you're giving a, anywhere from three to a thousand pages of documents, everything from financial to the minutes, to architectural control, rules and regulations. And it is very daunting, not only for the membership, for the board of directors, for their management, and now what's happening is they've given you these documents and you've got to make common sense out of them. The fiduciary duty ultimately is the seller's responsible to disclose. Without a disclosure package that we do, you don't know if they fulfilled their obligation. That can come back to haunt them as well as you. I had one a few months ago uh, where a lady bought her unit, closed escrow the first part of November, moved in, got the next year's budget on the last day of November, right after Thanksgiving, and found out there was a $50,000 special assessment for balcony inspection and repairs. Needless to say, she was pretty livid because it had not been disclosed because nobody read the minutes to see what was going on. Nobody saw any of the documents. They just kept passing them on. So it's kind of the game of gossip. You don't know you know, you whisper something into somebody else's ear, but unless you've got something you can put and rely on and you've read that and you understand it, it's not a big deal. I did a new construction contract. Uh, I think it was last Thursday or Friday. And one of the things that the buyer said to me is, you know, Jackie, I'm buying, but I want to know who's responsible for the um, garages because there's a huge crack all the way down the center of my um, my car, my car, my garage. I, and it's a brand new project. Do you think that that would be a warranty? The agent did not want to hear that. Unfortunately, I said, I, have, I make a list of everything that's uh, missing, outdated, or should be in the documents to help disclose. And what happened on this one, was they were so anxious to get the transaction closed, they really didn't think about whether that developer, because it was in within a five-year time frame, which is where we usually pick up all the construction areas, and they were selling that unit, and the seller said, well, I don't have to do anything about that. The association takes care of it. But if it's a warranty under the construction, they will end up in litigation for the project because in a condominium, they can sue the developer. If it's a planned unit development, then the individual owners have to sue. So in this particular case, it just happened to be a condominium. 
and nobody wanted to go back to tell the association what the problem was. And so they were going to move forward. And the seller, the buyer kept saying, you're asking me to sign off these contingencies. But this seems to be a big piece for me. And so they were trying to get information. Homeowners associations only talk to the seller. And in most instances, they'll talk to the seller's agent. Buyer's agents, buyers, they've had the big cross put on them because they don't want uh, to kill the deal. I'm called a deal killers every once in a while. But what I believe in is that full disclosure and allowing people to know about what they can expect and how to handle it, you're not gonna ever have any problems. If it's when they don't know and it's a big surprise, then they come knocking on your door saying, you needed to tell me this. So there's several different things around that. Is there any questions at this point that maybe we need to address to be able to move a little bit further ahead. Great, this is good, I'm loving this. <laughs> Usually by this time, we're getting a lot of questions. Um, so in, the, in this package of assessment, uh, association documents, uh, I was gonna see if maybe I can share one more. I wanna share with you a package that I got last week. Hopefully it didn't, I know it didn't belong to any of the agents in this office, in these offices. So I'm in good shape. Um, let's see. Jackie, this is Kristen. I had a quick question. Sure, go ahead. So you were talking about the situation where the client wasn't notified of the $50,000 special assessment. In that case, what is her recourse? Because I'm assuming she's probably signed off that she had acknowledged and read those documents. If but, it was yes, but you can't. Okay, so when I was in real estate school, can, that that little thing called uh, disclosure, you told me I understand it and I buy it. When you give them a package of a thousand pages and you expect that they have the facility that you didn't take the time to look at because the agent got that same set of documents, the seller got that same set of documents, your escrow company got that same set of documents, but nobody on that side looked at it, you have the same responsibility to know what's in those documents as what you're passing to the buyers. Now, I'll tell you what is happening with that lady, and I'm waiting to see how the outcome is. She called me last Monday and indicated that she's going to make them buy it back. She doesn't have the fifty thousand. That's that's just the basic. There's a lot of work that she did not know about. She did not understand how to read those documents. Her agent says, "Well, we only have three days. You got to sign off these contingencies." and then walked away from the whole set situation. They would answer questions, but they did not understand what was in those documents. The big things, and this is where you're gonna find that. So I don't know how that's gonna come out. Uh, I have seen agents being, when we did the no contingency, no contingency means you told me and I moved forward, but if you were missing a document that that information would have been in, they're on the hook because they should have known what was in that package. So it's kind of a catch 22. My goal is I've been working on this for quite a while now, but I think each association should have like a FICO score. One that addresses, did they comply, comply with the administrative, the financial, the maintenance, and the overseeing of the general working of that association and give them a FICO score accordingly which you can determine the financial help. I do that for you anyway in our report. You will find that we will give you what is supposed to be in the reserves, what is in the reserves, and what that means per home. So those are some of the things that you're looking at. Um, you're not off the hook when you do no contingency unless you knew all of those same things that were in those documents. And I say, my basic premise is that the association should be doing this so they get the FICO score every year. I'm still not quite sure how to handle, you know, 55,000 right now and going up of our housing market in the next 10. I'm still working on that. It's kind of in a dream, right? 
but I do believe that we all have to take a little bit of responsibility. We're all getting that check. And so that's basically what our job is in my firm is to take all of those documents and organize them. Let me show you uh, this, because this may help you all. So let's see who this is. I'm going to pull up. Um, 30, 20, no. I hope nobody did this one or has anything to do with it, but I just wanted to let you see what, what your clients are seeing and what you end up getting. Let's see, 30, 29. Okay. So I'm going to show you Oh, I have to share my screen, don't I? That would help. Am I sharing? Not yet. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So I'm going to show you what we got first. Um, let's see. I have the one that had all the good. Okay. This is what we got just for the homeowners association. As you can see, it's 170. Well, I'll get it 100. This is 254 documents, pages of documents, everything that you can possibly imagine. And it's broken down. Um, I'm, I have pet peeves because I saw this nice little uh, page right here that gave us a picture, not of the property, but of just kind of a standard page that they use. So that was what we got all run together. And I believe it makes it much easier when you can identify the documents. So we broke them down into each of the different sections. And so you see that we got the preliminary title report. Why do you need a preliminary title report? Anybody have a guess? To deal with the association. Okay, well, let me tell you <laughs> my favorite thing to do. So a preliminary title report will give you things like uh, whether it's a condominium or a planned development. And so I open up my preliminary title report. I take you down to the section and you all know this one. There's the property, all the information. But now we want to know what kind of property is it? So in the, in the property description, you are going to see this in a couple of different places. But as you can see, this says that it's a condominium and it tells you it's a separate interest and gives you some detailed information. And I think it shows up in this prelim one other place. You're gonna to want to look at your prelim and it'll usually say the word lot or the word um, unit. If it says the word lot, you're pretty guaranteed that, that you own the land as well as the structure. And if it says condominium, it's only airspace ownership inside the walls, floor up, ceiling down, and that's what you own. That doesn't mean that's what the association is maintaining. This just tells you the type of ownership and how your taxes are going to be formed, whether you own airspace, a specific area or whether you own a lot and that you own the whole building itself. So let's see if there's, okay. One of the other things that we're always looking for, most of you don't ever look at your prelims either. So I just want to remind you that this is an important document because if there's a lien against the property, there can be two kinds of liens from the association. One is a lien because they haven't paid their assessments. That will show up in here as a lien saying these people haven't paid. And the only way you can clear that title is for whoever didn't pay the assessments. They, you want that cleared off of that title. And so you're going to want them to make sure that that gets paid. Usually there's a collection company involved and that collection company will give uh, all of the documents that are necessary to take that particular document off. The other thing you're looking for in here is the conditions, covenants, and restrictions, anything that's recorded on the property. We had one the other day that it was kind of an odd document. And then I realized sometimes the association will do a loan 
And when they do the loan, they ask the ownership that if they have to use that loan in order to pay the special assessment, that they will do a voluntary lien on the property, which identifies that there is money outstanding on that loan. The loan in 99.5% of the time, you're gonna find needs to be uh, handled at the closing. So the seller will be paying that off because of that part of the demand. So you're gonna see all these different things. You're gonna see all the exceptions. You're gonna see, sometimes you're gonna see documents that are very, very old and then you'll find one that has um, something that's very new. Usually it will say restated and that is what you're looking for. So again, your preliminary title report is very important. I found, um, I had this one person that was saying, well, they've got a manager who lives on site and they live in this unit. And in looking at it, it was not a numbered lot. Therefore, it was owned by the association and it did not show up as being maintained anywhere in the budget. So we questioned it and the individual owners have had a line item on their budget. They were paying the taxes and any maintenance or repairs that were required on that for a property manager to live in. You're gonna, that's an, an unusual issue, but sometimes they do show up. So now the, remember that the preliminary title report doesn't just have a pretty name and a link to it where you can hyperlink these documents. We will get documents that are endorsed, which means that they're recorded, but you didn't get a copy of the actual recording. You got the carbon, car I call, that was a word I didn't use, carbon copy, because that's how we used to do everything in the old days. Um, the other thing in the prelim is that without knowing what these different documents are, Sometimes the association has recorded a brand new set of CCNRs. And for some reason, it did not get pulled onto the, the preliminary title report. That's something we do pick up because usually the homeowners association will give us those documents. Every once in a while, you will see that uh, the, uh, the title company might have a document that was never given or passed on to the property management so now you've got another document and it just might be the one that identifies a use of a private use of a, a little patio or something of that nature, some other kind of an issue. So the title report and tying it to all of these other documents is very important. I'm gonna go through just a couple. I wanna see if there's any questions though. Um, just stop me whenever you want to, if you've got a question about what we're relating this information to, okay? Any questions on where we are now? There's one here. I have a question. I do have a question. Oh, hi. What, hi. what, what is the question? Is there any difference between condo and townhouse? The difference between is that what you're asking is what is the question? What is the difference? Yes, yes. Okay, so remember I said that a condominium, always the title means you only own airspace. You own the walls in, the floors up, and the ceiling down. That's yours. You, have, you can do whatever you want to it with it, limitations of taking out a bearing wall that makes the unit above you fall down on you. <coughs> And those kinds of things will come up from time to time. Townhouse could be a condo or a PUD, so a planned unit development. So you want to know, is it a planned development? If it's a planned development, you own the land and the structure, and the association is in place to maintain common areas, as well as most of the exteriors of that building, like the painting. Sometimes projects uh, for painting uh, we're individual. We do have some single family houses, but they have an architectural control that tells you what color you can paint it. Most of the time, it does come up that it's part of the association's responsibility. We used to have people fighting over, well, my paint looks good, but yours looks like, ooh, you know. And so um, they wouldn't want to paint, but they couldn't paint one without painting the other because the stark difference would be from something that was kind of on the drab side 
to now a sparkly clean new paint job. And most of the time agents are staging their properties on the inside and it doesn't always make it to the outside because the association is responsible for that. Uh, does that answer the question? Okay, yes, yes, thank you. Okay, great. Thank Jackie. You. Jackie, yeah. there are two more questions here online. James Endo, can you go please? Hi, James, I see that name, I was excited. Hi, Jackie, wow. <laughs> It's always good to hear you. I love the information. Just uh, real quick questions. Number one, do we have a checklist of all the required documents these days in California? And number two, what is the process when the HOA doesn't provide certain documents that, well, they're all important, but, you know, that they don't provide it? I'm so glad you asked that question. Okay, so <laughs> I'll send you the bill. <laughs> Great. So you will see all the documents that you're gonna see on that list that you guys have. Articles, bylaws, CCNR, all governing documents cannot be separated from the property. Pro forma operating budget. A pro forma operating budget is not a one pager. It's usually between 10 to 100 pages because there's a lot of things that go into that pro forma mm -hmm. operating budget. Then you're gonna find that you have an insurance statement which is tied into that budget package. That's an important piece because your buyers are going to need to get their own policy that covers the interior of their unit for any liability. So if I come to dinner and I slip and fall, you either better throw me on the common area or be willing to pay the bill and you have to have insurance <laughs> to cover that, okay? Yeah. So that's some of the stuff that you're looking at. The certified public accountants report. If there's 75,000 of income a year, they're gonna be required to have a certified public accountant, not only do the tax returns, but also do a financial review of those to see if there's any uh, crazy stuff. Like I have a yeah. property that we do the disclosures on and they had won a lawsuit of a million dollars. So they put a million in the checking and a million in the reserve. It should have all gone to the reserves because it was all gonna be paid out in the work, but they thought it would be easier to access if they left it in the uh, accounting for the uh, common area item, monthly items. Mm -hmm. What happened is that that drew them out and made them look as if they were seriously underfunded. So the CPA at the end of the year looked at it and said, you know, why did you do this? Uh, put the money into the savings account, collect a little bit of interest uh, because you're, you're paying your taxes are paid on interest income only, and you won't look so seriously underfunded. They went to being 20% funded to being almost 70% funded. And I'm gonna come back to that because the budget is one of my favorite things to talk about because it always gets so much misuse. Okay, so now you've got, you've got your budget, you've got your statement of insurance, you've got your CPA report, you're going to come down and there is going to be minutes. We used to, we used to get newsletters. To be honest with you, I, if I had my druthers, I would have newsletters over minutes, but not all of the associations do uh, the job of being able to put that together. Right. Minutes are to be actions taken by the board of directors. How often do they meet? Um, what do they discuss? They have to have an agenda. They're supposed to have their meetings are supposed to be open. If they're gonna talk about legal or um, administrative, like they're gonna fire the manager or whatever, they're gonna go into an executive session. Those minutes do not need to be provided, but the minutes should give you a pretty good idea. Uh, I think that, I don't think this one did my, my job for me, but um, here's a set of minutes and it tells you what was going on. One of the things you're looking for in a set of minutes that a bill came out a couple of years ago that said the board of directors has to get six different documents and the financial, which is the income and expense sheet, the balance sheet, the delinquency report, the bank statements, and there's a couple of others rather than going into full detail. But those documents are supposed to be reviewed by each of those board members and ratified in the set of minutes. If they're not having regular board meetings, how are they doing that? And it's the board's job to oversee the day-to-day -day operations 
of this association. So depending on how many they said, I'm, I've been having a little tip with one of my property managers that he and I have this disagreement about minutes. And he, he only when I bug him, he'll, he had, they have four meetings. That the, depending on the bylaws, it tells you how many board meetings the, many, the board is supposed to have every year. And in this particular instance that I'm talking about, they're supposed to have four. When we do a disclosure package for that particular association, because we do that, uh, we have both sides of the transaction on that. When we do that, we automatically identify whether or not we got a set of documents. Mm -hmm. Well, if the minutes, if they didn't, I said, I, I only have one set of minutes for 2022. And he goes, well, why did you, uh, why did you beat me up on that? I said, well, did you have any more meetings? How are you conducting business if you're not having a meeting every quarter to do that? When they have a quarterly meeting, when it's structured that way, they just need to do the adjustment that they do for three months rather than just one month, the approvals. And it needs to be authorized. Well, they don't do that. And he thought that I had all the, all the minutes, which I didn't. And in one set of the minutes, they talk exclusively about thefts, break-ins, injuries to somebody, one of their uh, security guards, and a couple of other things. Do you think that's not important for a buyer to know? I said, that's self and safety. So he's, and I know exactly why I don't have the minutes because he hasn't produced them yet. And it's been almost a year. They're also an election once a year, depending on their bylaws, which will tell them how many board members, how often do they have to, to meet. So does that answer the question for you? I mean, the, the question, the standard of care is all those documents that are on that list. Mm -hmm. Just because you get a document that has that name does not mean it's in compliance with the law. And Jackie, right. is, there, is there a list of, of the documents that you generally look for where that would be something good for us to point our buyers to looking at and for us to look at? Well, <clears throat> yes. All of them are, but you don't understand the reason why something is there. So primarily, and I'm going to put in a little pitch, is that when we're doing the investigative work, we're doing an open book test on all those documents. So if you've got something that said budget, let's go to the budget. The budget in this particular instance is 67 pages long. What kinds of things? You know that list when you order documents, there's a one pager, I think it's a, they answer a whole bunch of questions, like how many units, but on the yeah. second page, it's all those questions. Well, guess what? This is where you find all those questions. These guys do a pretty good job of the budget information. There's one thing called the policy statement. That's one thing I would suggest that you read because that tells you all about how much are the, there's two general budgets in here, gives you some basic information on the association. Um, you're going to see if it's a condominium, they have to determine whether it's FHA and VA approved. If it's not, they have to state that it's not. Um, then you have to go into other things. Let me just, here's your pro forma operating budget. Everyone looks different. This one happens to have several, and I don't know why I picked this particular one. This is still under construction. Right now, they're at 500, 252 units. So you look at that, it tells you basically how much they're going to be spending for what types of things. Um, this gives you that piece of information. The other thing, and there, I'm not going to go through this whole budget, but there's other things in here that they have to put in such as a, a statement of delinquency policy. They have to give you an assessment reserve funding disclosure form that tells you how much is supposed to be in the reserves. I'm gonna see if I can find one real quick here for you. Oh, here we go. This is a statement that you're always gonna be looking for, assessment reserve funding disclosure summary. It gives you a bunch of those questions that you have on that second page when you're ordering the documents but you don't know if it got answered. Because if you get a one-page budget, you didn't get a pro forma operating. They're supposed to run them on the accrual basis. Many years ago, I was part of a committee that went to CAR 
and said, you guys, they were upset because they, they asked a bunch of us, well, why do you always put that you're 100% funded? I said, we have $200,000 in the bank. We're going to spend 20. We're 100% funded. And then six months later, they get hit with a big special assessment. So CAR did not like that. So they decided to get the bill passed that said, we don't want to know on the cash flow. We want to know on the accrual basis. When, when it doesn't have to be when it's due, it's about collecting the money so that you'll have it when it does come due. So the accrual-based accounting has become the standard of care, and that's where you get the deficit in the reserves. It shows up. So in this particular instance, you're not going to see one because it's a new project, but you are going to see some rather interesting things that I wanted you to see. Let's see. Okay, so this one is, it tells you what the assessments are. Item number three, this is my pet question that I always get into little tips with our managers. Based on the most recent reserve study and other information available to the board of directors, will the current projected reserve account balance be sufficient, and that's the word I want you to keep in mind, sufficient at the end of each year to meet the association's obligations and repairs or replacement in the major components for the next 30 years? They almost always, you're gonna see the answer yes, but the answer to that is the meaning of, the, of being um, replenished, or excuse me, being adequate or sufficient is that it's enough money that you don't have to raise the dues high or special assess. And in most instances, the board of directors is into keeping their assessments low. Agents call me all the time and say, oh, I just love this project and their assessments are very low. Well, what's the deficit in the reserves? Have they had a reserve study? Oh, well, they're keeping in low. Low does not mean that they have the funds operating. You can't change that. That's the water, the garbage, the landscaper, the pool service, uh, whatever is day-to-day -day operations. I have a project that I'm managing in San Francisco. Number one, my nickname for it, it's new construction. It's a six-story. My main name for it is that it is um, the Winchester Mystery House too. <laughs> and the reason for that is, is that when I went in there, all brand new, you should have everything you need to do a budget, right? Well, I found out that we have two 100 gallon tanks of water. Okay, well, they have to be inspected every year and they hadn't been inspected since it was built. Okay, cost me $2,000 to get them to inspect those and get my permits. That wasn't anywhere on the budget. So I just spent to that, then the, the per, people who are currently major owner in the building decided that they wanted a foot patrol security guard. Okay, $9,000, I have a $560 budget. That's eight, not over $8,000 more than what I actually paid in for that particular one. And it just kept going and going and going. There was never a day that went through. I'm not at the end yet, but I'm getting there. Uh, at least I know all of my little cubby holes and I'm afraid to open any doors that I don't know what's behind it. Because even my trash went up three times. We have to have three pickups now that we have a lot of people. The other thing in this one is that it's that half of them are rented and the other half are for sale or sold. And we only have six owners right now. So. You know, there's just quirky things about these. They're great concept, but when you really start looking at the interworking or the guts of them, that's kind of gross, sorry. Uh, you're looking at all these different things. You've got to look at the budget. You've got to look at the, the uh, prelim, and you should be reading the CCNRs. There's a section in the CCNRs that I direct almost every buyer to because I, I, and by the way, I take, remember I said I take the governing documents right off of the preliminary title report, hyperlink, man, I'm in heaven. And I can get all of this stuff that I need off of here because this actually gives me what was recorded. A lot of times it'll say conforming. 
some of the same numbers and the dates, but I really like to see what they're showing actually got recorded on the property. One that I wanna guide you to is the use restriction. Most of the time when we do the documents for you, we are going to OCR the CCNR so you can do a little search. And let me just go up here and do one. Of my, I think I think this one was um, was already set up for this. We're going to put in use restrictions. Oh, it didn't do it. Okay, so maybe this one. Ever, oh no, there we are. Okay. Use restrictions. Okay, come down. This use restriction is a section of the documents. Oh, I could do next. Sometimes I don't do what I should do. Jackie, there was one more question here while you're looking that. Sure, go ahead. Yes, please. Hi, Jackie. Uh, you told us about the liens that uh, it might be on the property or the whole thing. You said we can find that in the preliminary title report? If it's a recorded document that is recorded against the association, yes, you will find it in here. Uh, on, the, on the prelim, because it's a, see your prelim is any recorded document that has been recorded against that specific piece of property or the track. Um, my question is uh, like this kind of liens, uh, uh, we're supposed to find them in escrow when we enter escrow, right? Um, the prelim. Different time that uh, even if we have escrow and close the escrow, this lien won't show on the property. When you are the listing agent and you open up your escrow originally, it will be there. It will be part of that is the package that you're going to get and you will get the first one that will tell you all about that property, the name, the address, the location, who owns it now, the what the um, what the current mortgage is on it, all of that stuff will be in that prelim. So when you are on the buyer side, and that is one of the documents that you are provided or should be provided, it should be on your list, check it off if you get it, and it needs to be current because on most of them on about page two, three or four, it will give you the date that that document was produced. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people order that, I'm getting some now that they ordered the documents in November, were not able to sell it. Now they've sold it and all the documents or a lot of the documents, there's a new budget since then, there's a CPA report since then, all of this stuff is gonna come out. So when you're doing that, you want to make sure that you get a copy and that it is current. Sure, sure. I, uh, I, I got that. But my question, if we are on the buyer side and uh, we got into escrow, the escrow should show that too, right? Should well, you're going to get that in the document package that you get. Yes, the prelim is one of the documents that you will get on this particular transaction. That is a required, I believe, you know, I don't know enough about cars, new contract or going on, but I do believe that that prelim is a document that is required. She's getting the CCNRs from the prelim because there's a, a highlight on that for the CCNRs. So those aren't necessarily lean, they're things that run the property. That's what you're talking about. Jackie. Right? Yes. Jackie, I'm sorry, was there more clarification needed on the answer that uh, was just given? I'm not sure. Okay. You know, I have. I mean, you have to. The thing is, is that one of the documents, when you get all of those documents that you check the box on, is the preliminary title report. If you don't get it, you need to go back and get it, and it needs to be current. It has a date that's not more than 60 days old. Because, you know, when the preliminary title report, you know how when you go out to get a loan and that you've got a client that's a buyer and you've got a lender involved, the day of that escrow closing, that lender is going to pull up a new credit report to see if they went out and bought that 
you know, new refrigerator or the new car or whatever you told them not to buy because it would change their debt ratios. I see transactions kicked out because the debt ratio went out because they went and spent the money. You've got to get it recorded and then you can go do what you want. So you will find that you will get a prelim on every single transaction. If you happen not to get it, you want to ask for it. Thank you, Jackie. I have two more questions here online. Sure. The first one is Jelaine Forrester. Hi, Jelaine. Hi, Jackie. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. I have two questions. You mentioned reserves and reserve study. Yes. Given, you know, and, and I, I know with the cost of, you know, inflation and what have you, is there, you know, reserve studies are based on potentially that they, I'm sure they factor in costs in the future, but oftentimes that seems to come up short. I'm curious when you look at a reserve study and you're making a recommendation to a buyer, you know, what is, what is the threshold of a good, you know, of a good, well-funded HOA in their reserves? I'm, I'm curious what you use as a threshold. And then in ordering HOA docs, I know sometimes the um, management company offers a menu, like they, they, you can buy this, the pat, the, the standard, you know, the standard package, and then minutes might be extra, or some other documents might be an extra cost. It'd be great to know what you think is required um, that we should always order when we're listing a condo. Oh, I love that. Okay, both of those questions are excellent. And then I'm, in, I'm what I wanna, let me do just one thing. Let me finish up with that and we'll come back to both of those issues because that, that was exactly where I was going next is on the financial. How about the other question? Let's see if it fits into the restrictions. All I wanted you to know is that these, the, it could be called use restrictions, restrictions, but this tells you what you can and can't do with that property. This tells you about rentals. Now, rentals as of 2021, the association can no longer prohibit at least 25% of the units to be rented. They can put a cap on it up to, let's say 50%, but the minute you hit 49 to 50%, you're not gonna get a loan in there. So they're really looking at keeping their restrictions below that. That's why that uh, number is very important when you're, uh, you've got a buyer that's going in there sometimes on a shoestring and they're going to get stuck with that piece if, if they get down to having a loan, whether they can get one or not if the association is over uh, rented, okay? So my project in San Francisco, I have more than 50% rented right now because the developer couldn't close them. And so we, anybody who wants to buy in, there's got to buy in for all cash or put down at least a minimum of 20%. That sometimes will keep the, if there's a lender in our midst, that should keep the lenders at a bay, okay? So you want to see what that. So the use restrictions, when you get to the governing documents, one of the places you want to look, because your client's going to know this, tells you how many pets you can have, if there's a size or breed, size or breed restriction, all of those things. What Then there's an architectural uh, part that says what you can and can't do to the unit. Um, we had a client that uh, went in and started jacking, jackhammering up a floor and broke one of the suspension tension wires that made the unit above them kind of lean and crash through the ceiling. So you want to be careful on anything. So architectural and the use restrictions are your governing documents. Any questions about this? Because I'm going to close this one out. Yeah, quick question for you, Jackie. Would you mind repeating what you said uh, about the rental stats changing in 2021 and the yeah. figures behind those? Yes, and this is a mandate by law. So they can they can actually change their governing documents to match it. The, the new law is that those units that wanted to say, we don't like renters, of course, I don't know how they knew they were renters because they probably didn't have a headband or an armband saying they were but they wanted to restrict it to only 10% of rentals or 15%. They no longer can do that. That's not a, an enforceable uh, regulation. They were to re amend their governing documents to restate their rental restriction. They can have a cap on it. And the cap means that they don't wanna go over a limit 
Like if you've got a piece of property that's in the conforming loan limits, you're probably not one that they should have no cap on it, um, except for like no more than 40% of them can be rented. And they all, and I have not experienced this, but a lot of times they think that renters aren't as interested in keeping um, the property up and I've never found that. Um, again, you're looking at the caps and that's what the law says. And that if they haven't amended their governing documents, they can now be fined a thousand dollars a month until they do that. But you gotta have enforcement. So everything we're talking about today, it meets a level of threshold, um, whether somebody's willing to take the, um, the regulation and live by it, or whether they're they're going their level of um, what term I, is um, the level of liability that they want to take on. So if you have a threshold of you know, I don't want to do something that's going to cost me a lot of money. You got to look at what the risk management is on this. And this is what the report does. It allows you not to fully make the association compliant with the Davis Durham, but it allows the seller to perform their duty to disclose and what level that is, and a buyer to see what level of responsibility they may be taking on. Does that answer that question? So I guess as far as this goes, what's the difference between a cap and a restriction? Because it kind of sounds similar. I'm sorry, repeat that again. So I'm asking for that question that you just answered um, about how they can no longer restrict it to a certain amount, but they can cap it. Yes, if they, cap have a cap, if they have a lower cap, if anything below 25% is no longer enforceable. Uh, Okay. They can add, they can say we're willing to have 100% rentals in our building, but then you're going to be looking at whether or not a lender will go in and loan because a lender only wants a min the maximum of about 50, 49% renters in the property. Okay. So no, it has to be anywhere between 25% to... 50 yeah. or 49 percent for a turning percent keep it under 50. okay yes. thank you if they don't have a cap in there at that 51 percent then your lend your borrower is got to have a good debt ratio and they've also got to understand that the lender may not want to loan on the property willing to loan to them but not on the property because of there's too many rentals and it's a higher risk for a lender the lender is in, in the business of selling residential ownership, and that's what the loans are for. So that is, it is very technical. And sometimes you just have to, um, again, evaluate the lit risk. I, when I can tell you a great story. I had a, a client that I worked with for years and he had a buyer and the buyer said, I'm moving my mother in. Is your mother going to be on the grant deed? No. Then she is she going to give you any money? Well, yeah, she's going to make part of the mortgage payment. She was an owner without any ownership, and the association would not allow her to live there. And I said, okay, here's our risk. You can have her move in there, and if she gets caught, then you may have to move her out. Well, she got very friendly with the neighbors, and... I didn't think about this, but she was telling one of the neighbors, oh, my son bought this place. You know, I'm so excited about it. I love it here. Uh, and it just happened to be the board vice president. So they asked her to, that they told him he had to move her out or put her on the grant deed. So I think they opted to put her on the grant deed for about 5%, still protected them and everything was fine. So, you know, I mean, there's just many different twists and turns and everybody gets creative in all of this stuff. So, you know, I can tell you what I've been involved with or whatever, but this rental issue has become a big one since uh, the only person that the association has direct responsibility from and to is the owner of that unit. 
So they have to enforce it on that particular owner. So uh, even contract of sales seems to be coming up a lot right now um, where people are buying, paying rent and some of it goes towards a down payment and then they have an option to buy it or not at some period of time and depending on how the contract's written. So all of this stuff comes up and will show up. If these are specific items that your client has issues with, that's some of the stuff that we dig out of the documents. So I'm gonna take us out of the CCNRs and we're gonna talk a little more about the reserves. Anything on the CCNRs or some of those governing documents? Yeah. Jackie, there's so much great information here. I have two more people online who have questions. Do you um, want to take them now or later? Uh, are they dealing with financial or what we've just been we've done up to this point? Mm, I can't tell. Okay, let's take them real quick, but then I'm going to spend all the rest of the precious time we have together on financial. Okay, great. So um, we'll make sure that the questions are really brief, and then you can no answer. No problem. Okay. And you're going to have my phone number. I'm, you know, I, I don't charge an arm and a leg or anything like that. And I certainly don't want your grandkids. I have enough of those of my own. Uh, so, you know, we can, you can take some of this stuff offline. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Perry. Uh, thank you. Hey, Jackie, thanks so much for doing this. So um, I've sold a few condos and ordered a few HOA packages and the pricing that they charge for these HOA packages varies greatly. I've, I've paid, had clients pay a couple hundred bucks. Um, late last year, I had some clients pay uh, $880 to order HOA docs because they had two associations. And then on top of that, the buyers had to get the HOA cert and they charged $1,300 for the HOA certs for this condo. Is there any kind of regulation or how's this pricing? It seems like it's the wild west as far as how, how these uh, companies price their HOA docs. Oh, what a great question. Okay, so um, if it's a self-managed association, they can only charge the cost of reproduction and distribution. If it's a one that's run by a management company, they keep their monthly fees uh, for management down. And this is a profit center, a big profit center, my pet peeve of a profit center, okay? There is no regulation. The association can hire someone to do that, to give them the documents, but nobody does any quality control. They take your check, you get a set of documents, it may or may not be compliant with the law, and you sell it at, you give it to somebody as if it's gospel, and it isn't. So the big thing here is, um, I want to address the one on the lender certification form too, but I want to basically tell you that um, obviously the seller is, the law says that the seller is obligated to provide these documents, they cannot charge that back to the buyer. It is a debt that they owe for doing this. And they give them all the documents, but then they get stuck six months from now saying, well, I didn't get that in the documents you provided me. Well, they didn't know what they passed on. They paid $800 and thought that they should be able to rely on that set of documents. And every one of the documents had the right name to it, just not the right disclosure documents inside. Okay, so that's one I haven't really figured out. Of course, anybody who's in management would probably be screaming at me right now. But um, the truth is, is that I think that the world has gone a little crazy with charge as much as you can get. And if you don't give them something, let them come and figure it out and then come back to you, right? So I have seen associations being sued for non-performance of their fiduciary duty in disclosure. It's a long, hard row, but it can happen. And an owner uh, buyer could uh, do that if they wanted to. But and your buyer is the seller is on their way out. They pay the eight hundred dollars, give you the documents, and hope that it doesn't. They don't even think it'll ever come back to haunt them. Once in a while, it will. But again, there's that level of risk. How much risk are you willing to take in not knowing the documents that you sent out? are compliant 
and how much is the seller going to be responsible and what is the buyer going to be responsible for. So um, I do see a few lawsuits and I did have one guy that was buying lots of property to do fixer upper on and then suing for all the documents because they didn't. They had me do one report. As soon as I figured out what they were doing, my staff was never to take a, a, a request from them again because he was actually using it to get money out of the association. <laughs> and he was making a lot of money. He was getting those $800 back. The other thing about the lender certification form, this has been a very sore subject with most property management. Remember that I, I have a company that does disclosure packages for about 150 associations. We do civil code compliance reviews so we don't send a set of documents out until it goes out with all the documents or you have a statement as to why it's not there. On the lender certification forms, Fannie Mae decided to get really excited about knowing certain pieces of information. And because of the building going down in Florida, it lifted that up to a much higher level of uh, disclosure. And so in a lot of states, they started talking about doing when you're doing, this fills into the reserve, falls into the reserve study. So when they're doing a reserve study, they're not, they're doing an inspection, but it's a visual inspection. And what that form did is it had a separate page that said, when was your last engineering report? Well, the associations in most instances can't afford, nor do they ever plan to do an engineering report. They are now seeing the bad works on that because the balconies on condos, not planned developments, that the association has until January 1st, 2025 to inspect them and repair them. That's why that one lady got a $50,000 special assessment and it was not a happy camper. So again, the lenders are looking for risk factor because they're going to sell those loans to the secondary market to get more money to loan out to your clients. So they have a risk level that if they, I worked for a, a lender uh, for Franklin many years ago, and then I bought a mortgage company because I didn't like all the rules and I wanted to know what they were. So when I worked for First Franklin, I remember one day a month, we'd all get together. And in those days, I would have a glass of wine. Well, I learned how to drink wine because we were trying to gather enough loans in a package to sell on the secondary market to get more money so we could make more loans. And so it was a whole process that I had no clue about, but I learned how to drink wine. Still baffles me sometimes because if a loan comes back, those lenders are somewhat responsible for, I'm mean, not somewhat, they are responsible to buy that loan back and figure out what went south on it. So there's the lenders got really paranoid about this. They wanted engineering reports, not just a visual inspection, step on the deck. Yeah, you see some termites or dry rot, or it's peeling on one corner or popping up, or you can look down, you're down below and you look up and you see all the boards are you know, dry rotted or whatever. They wanted a better, um, procedure by which they could evaluate the level of risk. And so now as of um, a couple of, they had five years the associations did and they've waited way too long on some of this stuff. And so now they're finding it difficult to find engineering companies that can do this. We have some that are reserve study companies and we'll do the balcony inspections. Then they said, well, just do a few. Well, you can't just do a few because Termites don't eat just odd numbered addresses. <laughs> you know, right. they, they eat 24 seven, they're always hungry and they go for anything and everything in its way. Likewise, the associations don't maintain these things properly. Sometimes you've got someone who like me loves to garden and they got a hundred plants on this little patio. And now all the water that they use to water the plants have, have created dry rot underneath the plant planters. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on in these associations. And you can see why um, every day I learn something new and I'm an old woman now. 
some of the, some of you I've known since I was young, but you know, things change and the industry is changing, the requirements, your buyers are buying what they're buying and they don't know. The seller is selling and they don't know what they're selling. They just know that there's two kinds of appraisals. One is that one that you get from the appraisal appraiser that tells you how much the value of that property according to the sales is. Now I come along and I'm telling you what the value of that property based on whether they have a reserve study and enough money to do their inspections and their uh, repairs. And that moves me into the reserve part of this. Uh, reserve study companies many years ago were a bunch of engineering guys that used to get together and said, hey, we can crunch the numbers, no big deal. So like with this building that I have in San Francisco, I have to list every single component in that building that has one to 30 year life expectancy. And I have to know what did it cost to put it in? That's why, because it's a new contract, but I need to know how much is it gonna cost to repair it when it comes time. So that's what your reserve studies do. Components, life expectancy, cost of replacement. Now, I will tell you that this property manager I was telling you about earlier, he and I've had a go round because I knew that the cost of living index and just that number of how much do we need to be adding to the budget. And he said, well, I can't get 6% in extra income off of this, this association because the owners won't go for it. They don't have a choice. It is the cost of living. It is the index. It is everybody lives by. I don't know about how you feel about going to the grocery store now, but what I used to fill up my basket with and walk out, I could do it in three bags and still stay under 50 bucks. And I haven't gotten out for less than a hundred and the bags are smaller. You know, I mean, the, the packages that you get your, like my grandson, he loves uh, popcorn. They're much smaller, you know, so. That is the same thing with the components. You've got to evaluate that. And boards of directors know that that reserve study company will give them the list of what it's going to cost. Basically, now they have to have their manager, whoever's doing their budget, to evaluate that and add a percentage on for the cost of living index. So a lot of them haven't done that. So remember, list of component, life expectancy, life already used. If I have a $100,000 roof and I have 10 years and get that $100,000 and I'm on year five, how much should I have in there? 50, you know, five, oh, yeah. what is it? Uh, oh, my brain just took a vacation there. $10,000 at the end and I've got five years of it, I should have $5,000 $5, in there for just that one component. You do that to every single component. Now you have your operating costs day to day. You can't change the city of San Francisco wanting you to do inspections on everything and then some. And you can't change the amount of life expectancy that you have on your roof. Sometimes they'll say, oh, well, we'll postpone it. We didn't have any leaks last year. That's okay too, but then you've got to make those adjustments. Then every year you're doing work. So you have to subtract the work and add a new component pricing because now if you've done that roof, you've got 10, 10 years to do another 10,000 and that adjusts also. So you take what you're supposed to have in the reserves based on that reserve study and your calculations and your cost of living index, inflation, I should have called it that in the first place, inflation, and that's your reserve. You're operating as you're operating. You have to marry those two together and you come up with a number. What we do is we say, here's what you're supposed to have in the reserves today based on all these components. Here's what you do have based on your balance sheet. And it should be within 60 days because a lot of times they change and they, they use money. So you take those two numbers and you subtract one from the other and you divide it by the number of units and it'll tell you how much is deficit Per door. 
that's the number that I'm looking for when we're doing these reviews and our reviewers are saying, we need to know what that is. What is it per door? And then what is it on a percentage basis? So most of the time you're gonna find that your, your amounts are gonna be in the, there's a reserve study analysis. Remember that one I showed you that had the number three, will you have adequate funds? Well, there's another one that goes along with that that says, here's what you should have. And this is what you're expected to have. But now you've brought in the balance sheet and that tells you what you really do have. And those numbers are then calculated, divided by the number of units. And if you've got staggered assessments, you've got to adjust for that. But we just do an average. We give you the percentage funded. Everybody goes, what's the percentage funded? A percentage funded at 35%, if all they have is the roadways, could be a thousand bucks. Or if you've got lots of stuff on there, it could be in the thousands. The highest I've had this year so far is $85,000 deficit in the reserves per door. So that's the number that you're looking because the car bill that got passed, they wanted to know all of this. They also you said, buyers, the seller is leaving you a debt. They you because the concept is you pay for the use of the components as you own them and you go along. But then all of a sudden you want to sell it. And by the way, there's a deficit in that high market we just came out of a few months ago. Everybody was paying 300000 over and picking up the tab for what was being left behind. So that deficit is what is the deficit? What is the seller leaving behind for the buyer to pick up and sooner or later have to increase to do the further work or do a special assessment? The question for you, Jackie. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. That I could spend a whole day on with you guys because that's really got a lot of stuff. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, I have one. Um, this is Trace again. Thanks again for doing this for us. So I, I think the, the big question for me is if I'm representing a seller and we've already paid for the HOA documents. And then we want to send them to you to review because that's good risk mitigation for my seller. And you've only gotten one good package this whole year. How long does this hold us up? Okay, so the process is you give us the prelim and all the documents you got. Within three days, we're going to give you back an inventory if anything is missing. Then what you do is you send that list back to the association and say to them, um, we got the documents, we paid X amount of dollars. However, you, this particular one is not compliant. We need to fill in information. They may put you on hold. They may say, oh, ha, right. Thanks a lot for calling. And then you may not ever get another document from them. Your seller has done their due diligence. They got the documents, they had them reviewed, and they didn't get all the documents, and they have a list and a letter from an outside third party that tells them that. Now the buyer comes along. Buyer gets those documents, sees the review, showing that they had gone back to access further documents, and all the documents that were made available are there. Remember I said earlier that the package, it is not about being fully disclosed. It's about allowing the, buy, the seller to do their due diligence and the buyer to evaluate their risk in purchasing that property. And so both sides are, are perfectly handled by that. If we're on the seller side, that list, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll put little comments after, we'll put little comments after like, um, Certified public accountants report, last one was done in 2020. You need the 2021, 2022 will not be available till the end of April because it's 120 days after that fiscal year. You, and you, as an agent, say to your client, I'm giving you a brown envelope. In that brown envelope, anything you get, whether it's email or by certified or regular mail, I want you to put it in this package. That means they have to download it when they get it or pass it to you. That allows you to get more like the April one, probably the first week in um, 
in May, you're going to have that document, which now should be incorporated into the documentation. So we try to take off the burden of what did I get? Because you're selling a multi-million dollar corporation along with that home. Can't separate them. But because you can't separate them, there is a risk, whether you have a board of directors. I've got a board of directors that's very power stripping. And because he didn't want to tell anybody about, I was telling you earlier, about some of the problems that they've had, break-ins and thefts and you know all that kind of stuff. They, get, they send out an email blast. That is not adequate when you have a health and safety issue. So sometimes the owner will know that. You can see it in the minutes. Uh, it's very daunting. It is a three-hour process from somebody who knows where to look and what to look for to do these reviews. But three days, you get the review package. You get, the, I mean, you get the invoice with the information that is missing. Send it off to the buyer. I mean, to the homeowners association. You may or may not get them back. We say five days at the max. In the meantime, the buyer buys some time on that contingency. And, you know, because you can't ask him to sign off on something if you fully know that you didn't get all the documents, but you still want that little badge that said, I did my duty and I got the documents or I didn't get these documents part of the report. It's like a termite inspection. It doesn't mean that the associations are going to do it, but I will tell you that termites is one of my other pet peeves. I have so many of those. Um, but pet peeves because you do just the interior of the unit, yet termites don't just eat the inside if it's a condominium. So you really need to be having them look around for those little droppings that they leave after they've eaten half of your wall. Okay, so, wow, I definitely have taken up the time. Any other questions? Because I didn't want to overdo it. I've overloaded some of you now, but know that you can call me and ask me specific questions and I'll be here as long as you guys want on any questions that you want to have me feel for you. We don't have any more questions online. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, we do. <laughs> Joseph Caracas. Um, have you seen any restrictions to renting out a parking space? To renting out parking space? Yeah. You as an individual renting out your own parking space. Correct. Okay, well, if you don't have a car, what you need to know is I do see restrictions about your cars have to be in your garage and you cannot use uh, guest parking places to park. That means if uh, you have a best friend who comes and stays at your house for three nights a week and uses one of the guest spots, uh, that is probably a no-no and you'll start getting tickets. Okay. Um, sometimes the association, I don't see specific in the CCNRs restrictions about renting your parking place. But if you're covered under your garage and you have an outside open area parking, you could probably go to the board of directors. They would not care and you could rent that space because it's yours if it's grant deeded to your property. Okay. Thank you. Grant deed is a really important piece. What is part of my property? Um, we have another question from Marella. Hi, Marella. I'm actually here in the room. <laughs> uh, hi, Jackie. Um, I just wanted to mention, because I don't think we covered it, but uh, pet restrictions, right? Those would be in CCNRs usually, correct? Often, yeah, pet restrictions are generally in those use restrictions area. You'll see the kinds of ones that I see is number, size, and breed. Right. Those will be in the governing documents. However, I've seen some associations that have no pets. And that is not, if they've got a service dog, they have to allow for that. Uh, they have that would be um, something that the board takes offline in an executive session. The people would go to the association's board, give them the information they need to show that it is a service animal and why that person needs to have it. So they there are some restrictions that are not enforceable 
if the proper format of procedure has been established and they go to the board to do it. I see, thank you, that's great. Because that can be a big issue for some people. It is a big issue, yeah. Um, and the other thing that I try and talk to, when many years ago when I owned a management company, I was walking one day doing a property inspection mm -hmm. and I noticed that they had put in a new glass door. Great looking door, but we didn't allow screens. And all of a sudden, there I, behind this glass door was, um, they told me it was a baby ball, but I don't know about that. It was pretty damn big. Okay. <laughs> so you've got to be careful in looking at some of that stuff. And you've got the people that are doing some of this stuff, ask them, you know, if they're willing to take the risk that they might have to get rid of that pet if it's too big or whatever. And also thinking of the, the animal themselves, you know, is this going to be someplace where they can be cooped up in that little dining area or whatever? Sure. Yeah. Joseph Caracas, do you have another question? Oh, oh no. No, he's probably his old hand. Someone tell her no. No. <laughs> okay. All right, Jackie. So on our end online. That's great. See, I told you I could go an hour and a half, no problem. We could probably do more in another hour, half hour, but I think our brains and our uh, rear ends don't always take that into consideration. So in any case, I would love to come back if you guys have got questions, uh, you know the information and I'd be happy to help you and your clients. Um, and so we have your phone number in case we wanna check. Yeah. It's 408-226-5500. And I know Teresa has the email uh, and, you know, that would also be another way of getting a hold of you. Awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. All right. Teresa had to head out, but she wanted to say bye and thank you. Thank you, guys. That was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jackie, for, you know, coming in and teaching our office so many wonderful, um, so much wonderful information. A lot of us know you and love you already from over the years. And so it's wonderful to introduce you to a whole new set of agents. Um, if anybody has any questions or anything, let me or Therese know. And I'll also add Jackie's phone number to the Facebook posts. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thanks, guys. I appreciate okay. it. All right. Bye-bye. Okay.